I feel like it's important to have some sort of record of the way that people around the world have lived for hundreds or thousands of years that are now being lost. Welcome to the Greener Grass podcast from Bluebird Botanicals. I'm your host, Lex Pelger. Michael Beninav is a photographer and travel writer, but his method is more intense than your average wanderer. He has crossed the Sahara with a camel caravan, migrated with nomadic buffalo herders through the Himalayas, and turned these experiences into rich books detailing the daily lives of people so remote from the modern Western world. In addition to his travel work, he created a book about his family's story through the Holocaust and the unlikely events that brought his grandparents together. If you're interested in remote cultures or curious about the life of a travel writer, please enjoy this conversation with Michael Beninav. This show is brought to you by Bluebird Botanicals to spread education about cannabis and other things on the greener side of life. Bluebird CBD oil comes from farms in southern Colorado and is grown using only water, soil, and sunlight. Go to bluebirdbotanicals.com for more info. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today with Michael Beninov. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Lex. Um, so you're a writer and a photographer has been in so many places in the world. And so the first question is, uh, where were you born and what did you want to do when you were little? <laughs> uh, well, I was born in the Bronx, uh, but I grew up in Connecticut. And when I was little, you know, I'm not really sure. The thing that kind of the irony of what I've ended up doing is I remember being pretty young, maybe 10 or so, and thinking to myself, like, what would be the best possible job in the world? And I came up with this idea that it would be great to meet somebody who was really rich, but also really sick or something who, you know, somebody who couldn't really get around. And what they would do is pay me to go travel to a whole bunch of great places and then come back and tell them about it. So in some bizarre kind of way, that's sort of what I've ended up doing. Uh, the eyes and ears are all of us. <laughs> right. Um, so what was the path uh, through high school and college that took you to a career like this? Well, I think, um, you know, when I was in college, I didn't study writing. I didn't study photography. Uh, I was a philosophy major and got a religion minor. Um, but in terms of actually going out and doing these kind of adventures, uh, I think doing things like reading the books of Jack Kerouac were definitely very inspirational and influential and really just gave me some of the inspiration to follow whatever path seemed to call to me, even if it was alternative and seemed to, you know, break some of the rules of what other people might consider normal. Um, and I was doing some writing back then, but it was short fiction and nothing that was really marketable or sellable, but it definitely gave me the idea that, hmm, you know, one day it would be great to be a writer. And that had kind of lodged into my consciousness on some level even though it wasn't something that I was immediately pursuing at that time. And so then did you get started um, in doing journalism articles or more in the photography, or did you get right into this uh, first book? Uh, I really started as, as a writer. Um, in my later 20s, I took – I had done some traveling before then, but in my later 20s, I think I was 27, when I took really the my first – what I would consider big, big trip. And at that time I had been going through a whole bunch of different life changes. Uh, I think before that trip was about seven months spent in the Middle East and North Africa. And literally in the week before leaving for that trip, I had my master's thesis accepted, signed divorce papers and was on an airplane to Egypt. And literally from the moment that I touched down in Egypt, just all of these crazy things started happening, things that, that I couldn't even make up if I had wanted to. And I thought to myself, well, 
I'm being handed this material. And if I ever thought about being a writer, I don't even have to make anything up right now. Like it's all just happening. And so I started writing things down. And in the course of that trip, also really just fell in love with traveling and decided I need to figure out a way to continue doing this. And so in the process of traveling and writing, that all just kind of move things in that direction. And I was lucky enough to be able to, you know, begin the process of writing and getting published and kind of gradually uh, moving forward with that. Um, so what was the very first piece that you got paid for? Oh, God, I don't, I'm not really or sure. Or the first one sticks in your memory of like, okay, we're making it here. Well, the first ones were definitely not okay, we're making it. They were for very small local publications. Um, and, you know, really the the thing that kind of opened the gates to, a, a, you know, much um, more, uh, you might call successful pathway um, had a lot to do uh, kind of with luck. Uh, my One of my really good friends happened to be helping somebody work on their memoirs. And this person uh, who he was helping uh, had been one of the top editors at the New York Times, and he'd begun his career 50 years earlier uh, at the paper at like the lowest level you could possibly be, and worked his way up over the decades to um, being really the second in command at the paper. And my friend, for several reasons, uh, had to bail out on that project relatively early. And he then introduced me um, to this guy and recommended that I take over. And so even though I didn't study writing and didn't study journalism, all of a sudden I was helping this really icon of journalism tell the story of his life. And so through that, it, it was like just an intense and incredible mentorship opportunity. And um, also he was able to open several doors for me, uh, for example, getting my first piece published with the times he introduced me to the travel editor there. She was willing to give me a chance and things really began to move uh, from that point. Wow. So it was the New York times who, who got you started. What a, what a fascinating mentorship to be able to find. Oh, it was incredible. And really, you know, it, it was very much a matter of luck. So that's what everybody who is well prepared always says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so how, what did it begin as your career really started, you know, with the times pieces and then finding other work and publications as you learn the ropes of making a living this way? Uh, well, at first it was gradual where I was, you know, before I had really gotten into writing and before I had taken that first big trip, um, really what I was doing, um, was I was a wilderness guide, a uh, wilderness instructor working mostly with young people, taking them on backpacking trips, uh, in the American West. Uh, a lot of times uh, it was groups of young people who were struggling. Maybe it was taking kids who were in prison out on wilderness trips. Other times it was other um, populations of uh, youth at risk. And for a while, as I was beginning, you know, I was doing some writing and still doing some uh, wilderness instructing. Uh, and then uh, what, you know, what I think really moved things forward was I did an expedition to Mongolia, uh, which I wrote about for the Times, but then had hopes of working that into something bigger. And while I was doing some research after that trip, uh, I really just became intrigued with trying to find out uh, what the difference was between Bactrian camels, which they have in Mongolia, the two hump camel and the one humped Arabian camel. And I really began wondering, you know, is there some reason why some camels have two humps and some camels have one hump, you know, like evolutionarily or whatever. And as I began researching and trying to find the answer to that question, I happened to stumble across an article about uh, what's called the caravan of white gold, uh, which is one of the world's last remaining working camel caravans. And as I was reading about this, Really, the gist of these articles was that, uh, or this one article that I found, uh, was that this camel caravan had been working for over a thousand years, but now it was in its dying day because trucks had begun running this ancient trade route. And so, of course, um, you know, camels would soon be 
done with. You know, I saw it as sort of a Saharan John Henry story. And as I was reading about it, uh, it was clear that really nobody had looked at these camel caravans from the inside. And because of my fascination with deserts and my experience as a wilderness guide, it kind of seemed like a story that I was born to tell. And so that really motivated me to uh, go over to the Sahara and, you know, begin the on the ground research for writing my first book. Um, and so the first book is called Men of Salt. And for everybody listening, we'll put links to all of Michael's work. And it's all excellent. I I don't always read everything that someone wrote, but I certainly did in this situation because it was it was great work. Um, oh, thanks, Lex. Especially because, you know, you read, uh, you know, about people's travels. And this is some of the most intense physical travels um, in this Men of Salt book that I've seen anywhere. But then your skill as a writer of weaving in camel evolutionary history and the history of Timbuktu and the Sahara and how the, the camels made the wheel disappear as a piece of technology after the Roman Empire fell because the camels were so effective. It was, it was a gem to see how you weaved all of this in uh, along with the you know, the toughness of the journey. Oh, thanks. And so what was it, what was it like to be telling friends and family that you're about to do a thousand miles through the Sahara on camels? Well, my family was definitely concerned, um, you know, especially because this area, that part of the Sahara where the caravan operates, the local people call it the land of terror or the land of death because it's the dr oldest and the driest part of the entire Sahara Desert. And sometimes people who go into it don't come back out of it. But, you know, by that time in my life, I think people, including my family, kind of recognized who I was as a person. So I don't think they were all that surprised. And, you know, my family did a pretty good job of at least keeping some of their, not laying their concerns on me in a way that would discourage me from doing it. Um, so yeah, I think everybody was really glad when I came back and uh, even more glad when they saw actually what I produced from it. Um, and so what was it like to go in with not a, not a large budget and to make this trip happen with as only as much research as you could do beforehand and then come back and uh, work it into a book? Well, I mean, really one of the great things about travel in general, at least the way that I do it, is confronting the unknown and getting into sort of situations that you're not really sure what to expect and you're not entirely positive, you know, where the ground is going to fall beneath your feet and being able to um, go with the flow and have a great experience. And then in my case, also come back with a great story. And in terms of writing the book, um, it, it really was, I mean, it was difficult <laughs> for me anyways, you know, writing a book is not a piece of cake. You sit down, you have all this material, you have to craft it into a story that uh, will both be true because I'm working in nonfiction uh, and also resonate with readers and so um, it was really, I, I love doing it. There's something about that kind of challenge that uh, really resonates with me uh, as a person. And so it, it was just a great experience all around in that regard. Did you keep notes while you were out there in, in the middle of the desert? Or did you come back and mostly have it in your head? No, what I had to do, I definitely had to keep notes out there. But in a sense, all that I could do was keep notes. I couldn't do any writing out there. Um, you know, as you know, because you've read the book, um, the actual reality of being out there was so physically difficult. Being on these uh, salt caravans, we were on the move literally between 17 to 20 hours a day. And oftentimes we would break camp and we wouldn't stop even for a single minute until we got to the next camp, you know, 17, 18, 20 hours later. So physically, I was exhausted, and which meant that I didn't really have a lot of time or a lot of energy to be writing a whole lot of florid prose in the moment. So I would take just a lot of notes of things that I wanted to remember, details of the way things looked or felt or sounded. And because I had a lot of time to spend, 
just on the camel or walking next to the camel, I could craft sentences and paragraphs in my head while I was walking. And then maybe at the end of the day, write those down really quickly so I could remember those. But basically I came back with a notebook full of notes, but that I then had to actually construct into a narrative. And what was it like to be out there, you know, um, with the nomads and uh, to, to see this, this guy come in and coming along and taking notes? Uh, what did it feel like um, in, in people's perception of you? You know, people were really welcoming and open to the idea. I think, you know, they thought that I was a little bit crazy for just doing this, period. Which is true. (laughs) Because out there, you know, people really, like, they are camel drivers working this salt route because they have to be. You know, this is their way of making a living. It's what their families have done for generations. But it's so incredibly difficult that nobody makes this trip voluntarily. And the fact that I was coming from outside and wanted to take this trip and was willing to, you know, go round trip for a thousand miles on the back of camels um, through this really grueling desert environment, that part they thought was even more crazy than somebody sitting there, you know, writing notes at the end of the day. The book got nominated for the Discover Prize and some other prizes as well. Um, how did it change things as a freelancer and as a as a writer to have your first big book out there and, and doing well? Uh, well, it definitely helps to be able to say, I wrote this book, and to be able to point to really positive reviews of it uh, and the different awards and things like that, as well as just giving me the confidence that I can actually do this. As far as the career goes, you know, that really seems to vary week to week or month to month, where even having written that one book or now three books, some weeks it seems like, oh, great, my career is on track and I can move forward as a writer and as a photographer. And other weeks it seems like, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing (laughs) and I have no idea where the next job is going to come from. Uh, So even now there's a sense of, adventure about the whole thing. You know, as a young young kid, I guess this is the part you wouldn't have known about is the the ups and downs of it as you imagined this life. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely I think there's a fantasy that exists. I don't know if it's in everybody or maybe in some artist or maybe just in me where once you achieve a certain thing like write a book, then like it's done. You've got it you're a made man or whatever. And I found that not to be true where you really at least I still have to keep Uh, keep at it and keep coming up with the next idea and keep hoping that I kind of think of freelance writing almost as like swinging through the jungle on vines. And you're not always sure that as you're in midair on one vine about to release it, that the next vine is actually going to show up and be there. Or if you're going to go, you know, crashing down to the jungle floor. So (laughs) there's always a bit of excitement and unknown in the whole process. I think it's what makes the, your choice of your next book even more um, courageous and intriguing. Uh, so you wrote Joshua and Isadora was the name was the first name you used for it about your grandparents and them finding themselves uh, finding each other during the Holocaust. Um, can you talk about your initial ideas uh, to to write this book? Yeah, in some ways, that book had really been with me since I was a young child, you know, in terms of the idea of of writing and telling that story. Uh, and it evolved over time. And then it really constellated, actually, while I was on the Saharan salt caravan, um, for reasons I'll explain it in a second. But, um, you know, I'd always known since I was a kid that my grandparents had met under these really um, extreme circumstances. The, the two of them met for the first time on a refugee boat at the end of 1944. So while the war was still going on, uh, and they were sailing from Romania to Istanbul with the ultimate destination of hoping to get to Palestine. And I had little fragments of the story when I was a kid, but essentially what really lived with me was knowing that had it not been for the Holocaust, my grandparents never would have met. And so even as a child, I had this reckoning to do with the fact that I was a product of, you know, this unbelievably horrible tragedy. So on the one hand, 
of course, I never would have asked for that tragedy to happen. And on the other hand, my entire existence was dependent on the fact that it did happen. And so even as a young kid, I was very well aware of the tension between that. And then as I got older, um, I began to realize how much of their story I was missing. And so I began asking them about it. I sat down with them once and videotaped them talking about it. And the more details that I got, the more incredible it seemed that not only they each survive, but then they happen to meet each other and cross paths and be in the exact same place at the exact same time. When had any one of countless things been different, one, they may not have survived, and two, they certainly wouldn't have met. And so their story seems to be incredible in itself, but also just really symbolic of something that's true in all of our lives, which is that sometimes these very small decisions, you know, maybe you turn right or maybe you turn left, and maybe that means you get into an accident or you avoid an accident. Um, that these very, these very small decisions can really have huge impacts on the way that our lives unfold. And so I wanted to tell their story because it was incredible, but also from that perspective and looking at it as kind of just an epic example of all of our life, life stories. And the reason why that came up uh, for me, especially on the salt caravan, was because some of the things that my grandparents and particularly my grandmother endured um, were so unbelievably difficult that while I was traveling through the Sahara uh, with these nomads and sometimes wondering, was I going to make it to the next camp or was I going to collapse from exhaustion? I would think about my grandmother as a teenage girl going through the things that she went through and thought, well, if she could survive that, then I can certainly survive this. And it really just um, sort of fired me up to tell their story once I got back and felt like that should be the next book. And I'm curious what it was like um, for you to witness them sharing the hardest parts, because I think one of the things about the book is I actually grew up reading a lot of Holocaust literature because of my father. Um, and your book is remarkable in both being so open-eyed about the horrors inflicted, but also about the historical background and what was happening outside of their story. Um, between the microcosm and macrocosm, uh, there was so much there. And so what was it like to both be researching this and then listening and watching to your uh, grandparents describing it? Oh, well, it was really pretty incredible to be talking to them about it directly. I mean, and they, my grandfather and my grandmother had very different personalities. Uh, my grandfather was somebody, he loved to tell stories. And so there were parts of his story that I was already familiar with because he would tell the stories over and over again. My grandmother was much more reticent to talk about those times. And there was very little about her life back then that I knew. And in many ways, her story is even more remarkable than his story. So every day sitting with them was kind of an awesome revelation of the things that she experienced and really just who she is as a person. Um, and in terms of the historical background, to me, it was particularly intriguing because my grandmother is from Romania. My grandfather was from Czechoslovakia. And the things that they experienced were different than your classic Holocaust Auschwitz kind of story. Even though my grandfather's mother and sister were murdered in Auschwitz and his father uh, ended, up, ended up being sent to Dachau, his experience was one of being in these Hungarian army slave labor camps, which I, I never had really known much about. My grandmother's experience was one of being on these forced march deportations into Ukraine, which also, I didn't really know that much about, and which I think many people, even Jewish people, have never really heard about. And so I felt like it was important to tell their story, really just in order to fill out the history that a lot of people don't know anything about. Yeah, and it, and it was a remarkable job to, to highlight those lesser known aspects um, and to get a, a quote on the front and the back from Elie Wiesel himself celebrating it as a an important work to the the genre. I mean, that that's a, must be a wonderful thing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what was the 
uh, family's reaction once you decided that you were going to go over and try to find the places where all these events occurred and, and travel through the lands? Well, my family was really just thrilled that this project was happening. Uh, mostly just, you know, whatever happened with the book and however successful or unsuccessful, it didn't really matter. The fact that we were going to have a record of this piece of our history, they were thrilled about uh, because, you know, even my father and even his brothers, there were a lot of stories that they were unaware of, um, especially about their mother's uh, experience. And so everybody was incredibly supportive about that. And of course, you know, traveling to Romania and um, Ukraine and Hungary, those places are, you know, at least considered to be a little bit safer than traveling to the middle of the Sahara. So I think they had some relief about that. How did that trip go? Um, was that kind of the last piece of the puzzle for you before you sat down to, to write out the story? Yeah, I think I went there. I, I made two trips over there. And my real goal in going over there was just to get a feeling and a sense of the places where they were. I wasn't so much on a fact-finding mission because I had the information that I needed from them as well as from historical documents, but I couldn't really write about the places and create an evocative sense of those places without being there and seeing them. Uh, and so that, that was really the goal of going over there. And I went once while they were both still alive and then was able to come back and talk to them about it. And then the second trip that I took was after my grandfather died, but I already had, um, you know, enough information and had talked to him about the first trip so that I could go and fill things out more on the second trip. Uh, and both were, it was just incredibly worthwhile to actually be there on the ground uh, and see those places, especially because in talking to my grandparents, uh, it was real. like one of the challenges that I had was kind of pulling out the details that make a story come alive. You know, for my grandfather, he could say, oh, I grew up in this house in Czechoslovakia and think I knew what he was talking about. Whereas I don't know, and I imagine readers don't know what a house in Czechoslovakia in the 1920s and 30s is like. So we had to really slow down and go step by step over the details of this is what the house was like. This is what the kitchen was like. This is what the world was like there back then. And um, then actually going over and being in those places really helped fill out that picture for me and hopefully for the readers too. And where was it that you chose to, to sit down and really work on the book? And what was it like to go through uh, a process that's so much more personal? Well, I did most of the writing – if not all the writing at my uh, home in New Mexico, which is a great place to write. Uh, I love leaving and going out and traveling, gathering material. And then I love coming back here to my place uh, in order to do the actual writing. And this particular book was really, in some ways it was incredibly rewarding to be telling this story that was so personal. Uh, and in other ways it was really disturbing simply because of what the story is about. You know, as I was, um, because I grew up with their story, at least in very vague outline. And, you know, I knew that I was a product of this great tragedy. I had kind of, the way that I was able to comprehend it was that these horrible things happen in the world, but at the end, something works out okay. You know, in a way, it's sort of my way of justifying my birth, <laughs> you know, after this incredible, horrible tragedy. And as I was working on the book and really just seeing and sort of vicariously living just the absolute cruelty that was inflicted upon completely innocent people. I began to question that my whole perception of the way that the world works and saw this not as some part of some greater plan or some teleological trajectory towards the good as much as just something that was really just a product of human cruelty and, and didn't necessarily um, wasn't necessarily part of you know, any greater plan towards something better. And it provided me 
almost with a case of spiritual whiplash. And at the end, I felt really very empty after having dealt with it. And almost like my bedrock foundation of understanding the way that the universe works was kind of shaken to its core. (laughs) So uh, actually working through this in that way was sort of vicariously traumatic, um, at least in a philosophical and spiritual sense. What was it like then to to shift gears as you finish the book? And I assume there was some promotion and and lots of talking about it. Let's see. In terms of the specific promotion, um, this second book, Joshua and Isadora, was published by the same company that published Men of Salt, the first book. But the company had changed hands. It had been um, sold to somebody else, and things were really in a bit of upheaval. So the promotional aspect of this book was not handled all that well. Uh, it kind of seemed to me like their strategy was, "Hey, we're going to wait for Oprah to call," and she didn't. So <laughs> things were left a little bit hanging promotionally. Uh, but I really enjoy going and. Um, talking about this book and about this story because partly because it's so powerful and because it does relate to all of our lives, but also because there are just such incredible moments in this story. Um, When the book got republished uh, in India and then once it was published as an ebook, I changed the title of the book uh, to The Luck of the Jews because to me, it, it really kind of encapsulates a little bit more about the story, which is that my grandparents and their families, on the one hand, had the worst possible luck in the world. But my grandparents themselves also just had these moments of unbelievable, like almost divine intervention uh, that not only saved their lives, but a man, but allowed them to meet and come together. And so it's, telling that story of how you have both, you know, the most horrible, tragic luck that you can possibly encounter as well at the same time as just having this unbelievable moments of providence that unexpectedly saves your life that makes their story something that's almost cinematic. Uh, And so that's why, you know, their story is so incredible that I never really get tired Uh, of telling it. And so I want to ask about the the third book that you mentioned. And how long was it between the publication of this book and then the Himalaya Bound, One Family's Quest to Save Their Animals and an Ancient Way of Life? Uh, Well, let's see. The the book about my grandparents was published in 2008. And then I went uh, to go do the research for um, the third book, Himalaya Bound, Uh, the following year. And that book really tells the story of the spring migration of a tribe of nomadic water buffalo herders uh, in uh, the Indian Himalayas. So I went over to India and I joined, essentially I embedded myself with this one family of nomadic people uh, who live in the forest all the time and joined them on their spring migration up into the Himalayas. And I had really wanted to tell their story, partly because so much of my work deals with nomadic people, but I had never actually been on a migration. And I felt like that was something, a real piece of my experience with nomads that had been missing. Uh, And this kind of seemed like the perfect group to travel with, uh, partly because they're always living out somewhere in the wilderness. They never live in a town or a village. They're in these lowland jungles in the winter and then up in these high mountains in the summertime. Uh, Whereas there are many people who we consider to be nomadic who spend a certain part of the year in a village and then travel out from there and then come back to their village for another part of the year. Uh, And I really like the idea of being immersed in a community that was really like didn't have that kind of village or town or city experience. Um, But also the thing that really intrigued me about this group of people is that the main threat to their way of life is that their traditional territory where they live and where they graze their animals, some of that has been 
turned into a national park and they're threatened with being banned from going into their an traditional ancestral lands where they've been going for over a thousand years because it's now a national park. And so I was really struck with this powerful irony that this thing that normally I would consider to be a great, um, a, a great thing, you know, creating national parks was at the same time possibly contributing to the death of this ancient culture. And so I wanted to go really explore that story uh, and explore it from the perspective of the people who were being affected by it. Uh, so I went over to do this research and join this family and migrate with them into the Himalayas. Um, that was a year after the book about my grandparents came out, but the road to publication for that book took a much longer time um, for a number of reasons. Uh, so actually going from one book to the um, manifestation of the next book uh, took, I don't know, maybe another eight years or something like that. Yeah. Books can get tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was curious uh, about your freelance time in between you working on this as well, because you've done shoots for not only a lot of the major publications, but also for a lot of uh, nonprofits doing good work around the world. And so I was curious how you kind of chose and navigated that freelance or nonprofit uh, space. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of what I'll do is, uh, you know, I try to come up with stories that I'm really interested in covering, and then try to sell those stories to different newspapers, magazines, uh, whatever. And in the process of doing that work, a lot of times I need some help on the ground. You know, for example, writing this book about nomadic people in India, I didn't just walk into the forest randomly and knock on somebody's, the door of somebody's hut and say, hey, can I join you for this trip to the Himalayas? Um, before I went, I contacted a small local nonprofit organization that works with and advocates for this tribe. And I explained to them, you know, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. And asked if that was possible. And they then said, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I think we can set you up with a family and we can make some introductions. And so in a lot of the work that I do, having that kind of help on the ground is really crucial. And a lot of times it comes from these small nonprofit organizations or bigger nonprofit organizations that have some people who are there, you know, on the ground in the local scene. And so as a result, um, I'm always happy to share whatever work that I do with those organizations so they can use it, uh, you know, to help their causes because they've helped me and there's no way I could do my work without them. So that's how really the nonprofit piece comes into it. Or maybe I've done some work about a particular community or about a particular place. And then an organization will come to me and say, hey, can we use some of these pictures? Uh, and then, you know, I'll say, sure. How much are you, you know, finding someone to sponsor a trip ahead of time for, um, and how often are you just jumping and hoping this might turn into something, but you're going to go see it nonetheless? Usually, a lot of times I will simply decide to go do a project. And then what I'll try to do before I go is line up some stories about that. Pro like I'll pitch the story before I actually go on the trip. And then, you know, a lot of times we'll have that accepted. So I'll know I'll have either some expenses covered or all expenses covered. Uh, but then it's always, it's always a matter of then coming back and trying to then sell more stories about it or then turn it into a book or a bigger project. And so it's kind of a mixed bag. It's really a project by project kind of a basis. And partly as a result of that, I ended up actually starting a nonprofit organization to help fund some of that work. So I would be a little bit less reliant on the gatekeepers that editors can be because, you know, they can say, yes, we like this story. No, we don't like this story. Or they can say, yes, we love this idea, but for all these other different reasons, we can't accept the story at this time. And so I decided that I wanted to, you know, create a little organization and hope to be able to get some funding to support telling stories that I felt had intrinsic value, even if maybe I couldn't get them through an editor or to 
actually tell them in a way that was more complete than I might be able to do in a newspaper or magazine story. Because typically in a newspaper or magazine story, you have a set word count. You have to fit your story into that word count. And it's great, but it also can be limiting. So I wanted to have a platform where I could tell these stories in a much longer and more thorough way with more text, more images, including video, things like that. And so through this little organization that I formed, uh, which is called Traditional Cultures Project, I'm able to help fund some of the projects that I want to do and then tell them in a way uh, that's a little more complete than I can do in other ways. Um, and it's um, and we'll put the link to the Traditional Cultures Project in the notes as well if people want to support there. Um, and it looks like you have a great team of people uh, working there already. What's it been like starting a nonprofit in this kind of storytelling direction? Uh, it's difficult, mainly because, you know, a lot of funding for nonprofits, you know, especially working in different countries, they're concerned more with you know, what you might call development or aid or assistance in which an organization is going in and actually working on something that will directly help the community with some sort of project on the ground. Whereas this idea of storytelling and reporting about situations on the ground, it's more difficult to get funding for that because the funders aren't necessarily seeing direct positive impact on those communities. And as somebody who tries to take a non-biased journalistic approach, you know, if let's say local organizations want to use my work to help promote their cause or bring attention to the communities, that's great. But I really have to stay in a place that's relatively unbiased. And so I don't consider myself at least as directly advocating, um, more as really just telling the truth as I see it on the ground about these places and these communities and what they're experiencing. And so it's very that's very different than saying, hey, I want to go dig wells in places that need more water, or oh, I want to go build schools for children in places that don't have them. Uh, and so there's less funding for that. But you know, in terms of working with people that I work with, it's wonderful to meet and work with a whole variety of different people who have a whole array of expertise in fields that I don't have uh, that can really help me out and help tell this story in a way that's more complete. And some of the storytelling, I'm really glad you do. So according to your site, you still go out to middle schools and high schools to show them slideshows about the Saharan salt trade or other places that you've uh, done work with nomads or photography. Yeah, exactly. I, I love doing that. Um, you know, cause so much of what my work is about, I mean, partly I feel like it's important to have some sort of record just for humanity as a whole of the way that people around the world have lived for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years that are now being lost. But I also feel like there's something really important about just opening minds and exposing people to this way of living because it does broaden everybody's world who sees these pictures or reads these stories. And in particular, I like doing this with um, young people, with middle school students, high school students, and going into their classrooms and showing, you know, giving slideshows, talking to the students, answering their questions, because they really get into it. I mean, they're really fascinated by the way that other people live in a way that's so different from the way that we live. And at the same time, being able to connect to them as real live human beings, where we have something that we all share together um, as a product of our humanity, but just they happen to live in very different ways and have different belief systems and values. And so being able to communicate that directly with students is something that I, I really love doing. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it sounds wonderful. Actually, I'm father of a young baby myself. And just the idea of her being able to see these photos, we have books about how everybody is just the same. And uh, so I'd encourage everyone to check out Michael's portfolio on his website, because the images you can see there alone are uh, amazing pieces of storytelling. Um, and so I won't ask for a favorite place. Uh, obviously, you've been so many. Um, but the last question I might end on is if we could get you a six-month grant to go anywhere in the world for your next 
thing you want to focus on, uh, where would you be heading? <laughs> no, that's a tough question. I'm always torn between, or at least right now, I'm really torn between the ideas of getting deeper into places that I've already experienced and going someplace completely new where I don't know that much about the place and to have a, you know, a completely different kind of experience than I've had before. Uh, right now, there are some, I still find myself just drawn to the Indian Himalayas, uh, partly having spent some time there and just being really captivated by them and by um, the culture there and by the landscape there and the sense that what's going on there is so much deeper than I have been able to access. Um, you know, the book that I wrote about migrating into the Himalayas, I got really deep into one aspect of Himalayan culture. And there's so much more of it that I wasn't able to touch. Uh, and so, or have I had, you know, little tastes of here and there that are, you know, fascinating, but that I would really like to experience more of, uh, particularly in the mythology and folk tales um, of that area that are getting lost because today young people are more interested in Bollywood movies and what happens to be on television or Netflix or whatever. Um, and at the same time, have an urge to go, you know, completely new places that I've never been before. Uh, so for me, that's, you know, my own personal debate that I have to get into. But if you were to say right now, here's a whole bunch of money, go, I think I would really be exploring um, deeper into uh, the Indian Himalayas. That's great. Yeah. And humanity goes so far back there. And there's so many different ways uh, of, of humans living. Um, it's the beautiful part about your work. It's so human centric in all the ways that we we show up. Um, so I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to to talk with us today and, and for all the time it took to create these books and, and best of luck in the travels in the future. Great. Thanks, Lex. I really appreciate it. Greener Grass is a Bluebird Botanicals podcast. Their CBD oil supports a healthy body and a strong endocannabinoid system. They've got friendly customer service who can answer any of your questions, and the number is right there at the top of their webpage. But, per the FDA, they won't be able to make any medical claims for these nutritional supplements. That's also the reason you'll hear little about CBD on this show. There's no need for us to add more evidence about CBD when a simple Google search will give you more than you can read in a month of Sundays. So this show covers the cannabis world and more with editorial freedom from Bluebird Botanicals. Thanks for joining the Greener Grass Podcast. As always, our audio alchemist is Matt Payne. The Gypsy Jazz theme music comes from Brett Van Donsel. Our beautiful bird sounds are courtesy of Lang Elliott. And I'm your host, Lex Pelger, wishing you a bright green day. <laughs>